All right, come on, make some noise if you're excited to be in God's house today. <laughs> Amen. We're in part two, the second installment of this series, Anxious for Nothing, that that's possible. The Bible says that's possible. I'm going to teach you how. So today, if you're struggling with anxiety, the studies show it's actually because one of four reasons, or multiple of these four reasons, but studies show it's one of four reasons, that we feel um, unsafe, that we feel uncertain, we feel unhealthy, or we're unaccompanied, like we're isolated and alone, and our body knows it, our spirit knows it, and the alarms are going off. Um, today, I'm going to help you kind of navigate that journey. And like I said last week, um, uh, this is going to be a four-week series, and I'd love for you to maybe put down your guard a little bit, because it is going to take about four weeks to, to tackle this subject from the different angles. And I do want to reiterate that, because, because some of you couldn't wait and sent me some emails, and you're like, what about this? And what about this? Calm down. I will get there. I will get all the angles of this very complex topic if, if you give me about four weeks to tackle this. Here's our theme verse, Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 6. Here's what the Apostle Paul says, do not be anxious about anything. How audacious, right, that the Apostle Paul could say this. He must not know, like, our context and our culture and our, our version of reality. I mean, that was back then. Paul is in prison saying this, in prison. Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, Present your request to God. And here's what happens if you'll do that. He says the peace of God. This isn't the peace the world gives. This is a supernatural peace that transcends, he says, all understanding that will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, remember, anxiety isn't a sin. Anxiety itself is not a sin. It's a signal. It's that built-in alarm system. It's part of the design of God. It's the fire alarms that are going off inside of you saying something's wrong, something's off something's on fire. There's, there's two types of anxiety. There is what they call facilitative anxiety and debilitative anxiety. Facilitating anxiety is like what's actually beneficial for you. It helps your performance. It's like the excitement and motivation you get before a game. You ever felt that before before a game? You're, you get excited. That's a facil facilitating anxiety before a test or before a presentation. That's kind of normal facilitating anxiety, but some people have debilitating anxiety anxiety, where it's not like it doesn't enhance their performance, it, it interferes with their performance, their thoughts, their, it even can manifest in symptoms, physical symptoms in their life that seem like they're out of their control. Last week, we talked about uncertainty, and we learned that I don't need certainty, I need to trust God. Amen, somebody? Like, that's what I need. God hasn't promised me certainty. I don't need to have all the answers, and I don't need to understand everything. In fact, if I want the peace of God that transcends understanding, then I actually have to give up my need to understand and control everything because the peace of God actually supersedes. It transcends all of that. Today, we're going to talk about the second reason you might be experiencing anxiety today. We feel unsafe. The title of today's message is Obsessed with Safety. I wonder how many of us today are obsessed, which I think we're living in a world today that's very obsessed with safety, physical safety, emotional safety, our home safety, <laughs> the alarms and cameras and everything, our, our, our uh, children's safety. Second, uh, look, when, when, you're, when you are obsessed with safety, you become vulnerable to the spirit of fear. Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 says this, y'all know this, for God has not given us that spirit of fear. He's given you a different spirit. Look at it, the spirit of power, the spirit of love, a spirit of a sound mind. As a society, we're obsessed with safety. I think about all the changes even since I was a kid. When I was young, we didn't wear seatbelts when, we when we drove in cars. There was no car seats even. we fall asleep on the floor mat or in the back of the station wagon. No car seats. We would sit like in, toddlers in mom's lap. The only seatbelt was mom's grass. That's it. That was, that was seatbelt. Mom going like that, okay? No one wore a helmet when they rode a bike or a skateboard. And, and the playgrounds were basically a death trap, you guys. We had these merry-go-rounds that were basically a spinning vortex of death. How many of you remember that? Okay. And then the slides. The slides were like a 70-degree incline and made of metal. 
So they baked in the sun, and you got on it anyway, right? You got like, you got a third degree burn or something as you're going down. And then there were no like, there wasn't padding down there at the bottom, were there? It was solid, pure asphalt down there. It's a wonder any of us survived our childhood. But today, there's a lot of people obsessed with safety. They're constantly evaluating things around them with this lens. Here's the question so many people are asking themselves constantly throughout life, am I safe? Am I safe? Is, is, is this safe? Now, to a degree, we all ask this question kind of instinctively in a facilitating way, but many people do so in a debilitating way. And most of the time, that am I safe constant question running through your mind stems from wounds of our past when our safety was threatened. It comes from any form of abuse, physical, sexual, emotional, psychological, even rejection. But that suppressed trauma, it'll continue to reemerge in the form of consistently asking that question, am I safe? And when that question gets answered with a yes by your environment, life's good. You feel good. But when that question gets answered with a no, it sends you into the scramble. Y'all know what the scramble is? The scramble is that chaotic reaction to when your safety question gets answered with a no or a maybe, and it's all the behaviors and the chaotic decisions you make to try to force a yes answer so that you can feel safe again. We're gonna come back to that because we'll see it play out in our text today as we study the people of Israel coming out of their own trauma and slavery in Egypt and, and how their past wounds continue to haunt them even in their present situation. We're gonna be in Numbers chapter 13, and 14. I got a lot of scripture to, to share with you today because I love the word of God. How many of you love the word of God? Amen. We're going to be in Numbers chapter 13 and 14 if you want to turn there in your Bibles. If not, we got sermon notes as well. It'll be up here on the screen. At this time though, Moses has already led the people out of Egypt, out of slavery, and, and he's actually led these Israelites to the very edge of the promised land. They're at the southern border of Canaan. They're not in the promised land yet, but they're at the southern border of it about to go in. And in Numbers chapter 13, starting at verse 1, the Lord says to Moses, send some men to explore the land of Canaan. That's the promised land, which I, look what he says, which I am giving to the Israelites. Notice the language here. God says, I'm already doing, this is done. I'm giving this. It's yours. It is the promise to you. From each ancestral tribe, send one of its leaders. So there were 12 tribes of Israel, so they would send 12 spies into the land to go explore Canaan, the promised land. We're going to discover in this story that these 12 men, you guys, they saw the same thing. They saw the same land. They saw the same people that lived in the land, but they interpreted the same experience in very different ways. Let me frame this story today with this thought. You get to choose your focus. You get to choose what you fixate on and focus on. Are you fighting for safety or are you fighting from safety? We're, we're going to see that these 10 spies, 10 of the spies, they were obsessed with safety. When they saw the promised land, they saw it as something that was threatening to them and needed to be fought for. But two spies, namely, we're going to discover Caleb and Joshua, had a different perspective. They saw the protection of God following them all throughout the desert, all the way through Egypt. And they were grateful that God would give them a land that was so fruitful. But you get to choose your perspective. Listen to me. When you are obsessed with safety, it skews your perspective. You don't see things right. You don't see things the way that God wants you to see them. Let me be very clear, though, and just say safety is necessary. It's the foundation of a grounded, abundant life. When we feel protected, we thrive. It's when our safety is in question, though, our best selves are compromised. Safety is the fundamental element for a happy life. It's like air and water. Without safety, life is impossible. And those with a constant question in their mind, though, am I safe, they know this very well. They live in a constant state of high alert. Everything can be seen as a potential threat, and life often feels like a life and death situation. So when the am I safe question is answered with a no, many people, they, they get into this base animal instinct really quickly of fight or, or flight or of freeze or appease and, and the people around them are the ones who often suffer the consequences relationships suffer greatly because people are obsessed with safety they don't know how to trust and so they're, they're they can't be vulnerable and they lack it so relationships are strained and much of their time and energy are spent in assessing and eliminating risks they constantly scan the world for danger and are always waiting for the other shoe to drop anxiety 
and alarm. They're such a part of the inner world, it, it becomes normal. These 12 spies, they went in to inspect the land, and only two spies saw it from the perspective of God's safety, of God's covering, of God's provision. And the other 10 saw it as a threat to their safety. So they go and explore the land, the promised land in Canaan, for 40 days. And the 12 spies, they come back in Numbers chapter 13, verse 26. They come back in Moses, to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. There they reported to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. It was great. It was fruitful. They gave Moses this account. We went to the land to which you sent us, and yeah, it does flow. Like God said, like you said, Moses, with milk and honey, here's the fruit. It was enormous. But look at this. They lost their focus. But they didn't get focused. They, were, they, were, they focused on the wrong thing. But... The people who live there, they are too powerful, and the cities are fortified and large, and we saw descendants of Anak there. Those are the giants. They said, we can't attack these people. They forgot what God said. They lost their focus. They forgot what God did and how he delivered them in miracle after miracle after miracle, leading them to this point at the brink of the promised land, at the very edge. We can't go forward. We can't attack these people. They're stronger than we are. And they spread among all the Israelites that bad report, that negative report, that perspective spread about the land they had explored. They said the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there. The descendants of Anak come from the Nephilim. We seem, look what they said, we seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes and we look the same to them. I call this grasshopper vision. This is seeing yourself inferior and imagining other people seeing you the same way. You're already defeated. Already they're defeated. What happens when you get obsessed with your safety? Write this down. We get stuck in negative rumination. We get stuck in this negative rumination. Rumination, ruminating is a pattern of thinking that becomes deeply engraved in your brain. It creates a repetitive neural pathway that just makes it easier and easier for you to think those thoughts and go there again and again. Rumination can become a huge problem when you are excessively negatively thinking and you are excessively talking down to yourself. It creates these wrong pathways in your brain. The good news, though, is that you can actually rewire your brain. Amen, somebody? God created you this way, that you can actually rewire your brain. The scientific term for it is called neuroplasticity. And I'm not going to give you a science experiment, nothing like that. But it refers to the brain's ability to learn new things. So at a young age, your plasticity is really high. Like it's, it's flexible. You learn quickly. But as you age, it's not as easy. And this explains why the things you learned in childhood are hard to shake when you're an adult. Because as an adult, your mind is more rigid. As you're young, you're more receptive and flexible and open, but as an adult, your mind becomes more rigid. So imagine with me the Israelites who picked up in their childhood in slavery in Egypt, they picked up a poverty mindset, a diminished mindset, a, a slavery mindset that was inferior mindset. Now, as adults, they're having to rewire their brain to freedom and dominion. They're having, what, what, what a hard thing they're having to learn here. And many of them are having a hard time turning the corner. The story continues because of that bad report in chapter 14, verse 1. That night, all the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron and the whole assembly and said to them, if only we had died in Egypt are in the wilderness. They, didn't, they were so terrified of moving forward, they would rather die right where, just, we would rather die than go forward into the promised land. Verse three says, why is the Lord bringing us to this land? Only to let us fall by the sword. Now they're gonna follow the rabbit trail. Look at this. Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Do you ever find yourself, when you become obsessed with your safety, you follow the rabbit trail of negative thinking, you start creating scenarios. Anyone do that? Anyone do that? Like, you just start like, like, oh my gosh, and then, and then I'm, she's going to leave me. Kids are never going to want to come over again. I'm going to lose my job. You're just, like, you're just like following stuff down. You follow the rabbit trail of negative thinking. Now our ruminating on the wrong things leads us to write this down. Become hypervigilant against worst case scenarios that we're building in our mind. This is where catastrophizing begins. We're, we're creating worst case scenarios 
about things are going to happen. This, we see this happening maybe at a large scale in an election year like this one, where people are going, if my candidate doesn't get elected, America is over. It's, I'm leaving. And, and it's just this catastrophizing Worst case scenario, you see it happening maybe at a smaller scale when you're the passenger in a, in a vehicle with someone who drives a little bit fast and you're grabbing the God help me handle, right? And you're like, yo, God, and you start thinking, you visualizing the crash now. What are my kids going to do? What am I, do I have, do I, okay? Or maybe someone gets diagnosed with a serious illness and you begin to consider, what if I get that? But what, what, what that happens to me? And you, your rumination builds into creating a plan of worst case scenarios. Oh my goodness. Scented, they say scented candles cause that cancer illness and scented soap and lotion. And so you, you throw out all the bath and body, $200 worth of bath and body out of your house. <laughs> Only the next month buy it all back again. When you're out of the scramble, Right. Because you got in the scramble. And this is where Israel, look, this is where Israel's at. They're in the scramble. Oh my God, our wives are going to be dying, guys, and our kids, what, we're going to die. And they're just all over the place, man. They're not thinking right. Their perspective is skewed. They're obsessed with their safety. Verse 3 says, wouldn't it be better, look what they say, for us to go back to slavery? This is, this is the scramble. They're not thinking their perspective is skewed they're so obsessed with their safety wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt and then they said to each other we should choose a leader a new leader who would take us back we want someone other than Moses you guys Moses his face radiated with the glory of God he would like go into the tent of meeting, come out, and he would just, he would shine with the radiating anointing and glory of God's presence. This is the one who met with God in a pillar of fire and brought the commandments and miracles and signs and wonders and let him out and all the, the play. All. They go, we should choose a new leader. Who's going to take us back to, to slavery, to where we were beaten, to where we were killed, to where our children were snatched out of our arms and murdered. Let's go back there. They wanted to go back. Here's what they wanted to go back to their familiar trauma. That, that's, that's, and, and often trauma is the originator of this question, am I safe? It's the originator of our obsession with safety. Trauma on the brain is like having a hundred hidden video tabs open on your computer. It, it overloads the operating system. Even though you're safe, it's hard to accept and embrace that reality. And that's because trauma lives, they say, on the right side of the brain, which is the eternal now part of your brain, which, which means it's why your body and your brain interpret past trauma as still happening right now. Because it's living. You haven't dealt with it. It lives in the right side. And it could be even a more subtle childhood experience rather than a direct trauma like the Israelites. Maybe you grew up with an anxious mother who, who was always worrying that you were going to get hurt and put that worry in you. Maybe you are the anxious mother in here today that puts that worry, like, a, like whether it's at a dinner table or every time before they leave the house, you're like, be careful, be safe. Dangerous world out there. And you might tell them stories about other kids getting kidnapped. Other kids getting hit by cars and stuff. They would care out there. You get trafficked. You, that's what they do to kids out there, okay? And you might, you might tell them stories like that, and you want, your intention is to, is to make them aware and to protect them, right? But what you might unknowingly be doing is you're branding that question in their minds forever. Am I safe? Obsessed, obsessed. You're creating an obsession with safety. Some parents, they, they, they constantly tell their kids whenever they leave the house, be careful, be safe. But really, you know what they're saying? They're saying, keep me safe. Because a little bit of their heart is leaving with them in a dangerous world, and they don't know how to handle that in a healthy way except to instill fear. Am I preaching at you today? Come on, guys. Are you receiving this? So what do we do when, when we don't heal from trauma from our past? Write this down. We attempt to control the future by anticipating and avoiding risks. And this is what the Israelites are doing. They're trying to control their future by avoiding the risk of moving forward. We are not being led by the Spirit of God or the will of God, but by powers and principalities operating through our wounds in our past. If today you see this unfolding in your life, this obsession with safety that is not allowing you to be led by the Spirit, I want to show you how to operate from a different spirit today. To operate 
from a different spirit because it is possible to see the world as it is, to see the giants, to see the enemies from the perspective of God's power, God's providence, and God's provision. It is possible to be anxious for nothing. No matter what this world throws at you, Caleb and Joshua were operating by a different spirit, and they interpreted the same things, the same people, the same experiences very differently. Look how God responds now in verse 23. He says, no one who has treated me with contempt will ever see the promised land. But because my servant Caleb and Joshua had a different spirit. Now notice he says they had a different spirit, which means that, that these other 10 spies that were spreading a bad report, that got focused on the wrong thing, they were operating by the wrong spirit. It was, it was a wrong spirit that they were operating, that they weren't just spreading a bad report. Listen to me, they were spreading the wrong spirit in God's people. And Caleb and Joshua, they had a different spirit. And follows me wholeheartedly. I will bring him into the land that he went to and his descendants will inherit it. Not one of you, he says, will enter the land. I swore with uplifted hand to make it your home. They would actually wander to the desert for 40 years. And this is why. They, so they explored the land of Canaan, the spies, for 40 days. They wandered for one year for every day that they explored the land. 40 years they would wander. And those 10 spies that gave that bad report and that bad spirit to the rest of the Israelites, they actually died before the Lord of a plague, dropped dead. The Bible says, except Caleb, and, Caleb son of Jephunneh and Joshua, son of Nun. Only Caleb and Joshua survived that went into that land. God had promised Israel victory. The land he commanded them to take was already theirs. They simply had to just trust and obey God, but they were so obsessed with their safety, they couldn't move forward. Listen to me, church. God will never lead us to where his grace cannot provide for us and his power cannot protect us. Instead of being obsessed with your safety, how can we operate from a different spirit? Let me give you some thoughts here. Number one, we have to identify the specific fears that are holding us back. We have to identify the specific fears that are keeping us on the other side of the promise of God and of the will of God and of what he already has for us. Now, it's natural to feel fear, but when you let it consume us, it can hold you back from doing the things that you know God has called you to do, from stepping into everything that God has called you to step into, from stepping into the promise and the purpose of God for your life. Fear can hold you back, but the spirit of God can make you bold. Can I get an amen, church? Come on. Romans 8.15 says, the spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. So what is it? What is holding you back? What are you obsessing over? We have to identify those things like the specific fears. It might be a fear of death that keeps you bound from actually going the places that God has called you to go, doing the things that God has called you to do. You might have a fear of the enemy the fear of Satan, and it keeps you from entering boldly with authority into spiritual warfare for your marriage and your family and your calling. You may have a fear of rejection that keeps you timid and, 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 and voiceless. You have to identify the specific fear that's holding you back. Proverbs 28, 13 says, whoever conceals their sin does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces them finds mercy. Now remember, I said anxiety in and of itself is not a sin. But listen, when you allow that anxiety and your obsession with safety to cause you to not accomplish the will of God in your life, when you listen to the wrong report, when you get focused on the wrong thing and you disobey the will of God in your life, that's sin. The anxiety wasn't the sin. That was just an alarm alerting you that you were off, your focus is getting off, and you need to revert your attention somewhere. But you didn't listen to the alarm the right way. You, so that, so, so, our, our natural human tendency is to conceal the sin, to conceal the fear, conceal our insecurity, con conceal the, our obsessions and our obsession with safety. But the spiritual response is to confess them and come clean to Christ. To confess, and, and Proverbs says confess and renounce. So don't just confess it, but renounce it. Renounce means to, at the root, call it out, pull it up. I don't just say, man, I'm sorry, man, I shouldn't have done that, I shouldn't have said that. Oh, God, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry for saying, I'm sorry for thinking that. No, 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 you got you to pull whatever that was up by the root. 
What was the fear? What was the fear? Was it rejection? Was it a fear of control? What, 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 what is it? Your fear of marriage? Your fear of divorce? Some of you, you don't enter into those difficult conversations. Those, you don't share honestly with your, with your spouse because you're afraid that they'll leave you. Okay, so what is it? What's at the root of that thing that needs to come up? You got to identify the fear, confess and renounce it. Number two, replace those fears with trust in God's promises. The tr- God's word needs to be the buoy keeping you afloat. It is the buoy that's keeping you afloat. Psalm 91 is a powerful psalm to return to any time that you are feeling unsafe. I just put in your notes, I just put Psalm 91 because I just didn't know what to put. It's, it's a psalm with 16 verses, and I'm going to read all 16 verses to you if you don't mind, okay? It just is a, is a powerful psalm that is on record. This psalm is on record, you guys, with, with actually protecting people from all kinds of danger and war. For instance, a commander in the Vietnam made his troops quote this Psalm 91 every day, whether they liked it or not, and it paid off. Every one of them came home safe. Every one. In fact, there was an army ranger in Vietnam after the first service that came up to me and said, I was one of them. I read Psalm 91 every day as a paratroop ranger in Vietnam, and all of us came home safe. Okay? There's a similar testimony was given about a group of soldiers in World War II from a very small town called Sea Drift, Texas. The, the mothers, the spouses would gather together and they would pray Psalm 91 every day for the men of their town and all men of Sea Drift, Texas came home safe. Not one of them were killed in battle. It, it's, it was a miracle and there's been many miracles like this. This kind of protection of God is provided for us. I'm gonna read you all 16 verses. If you don't mind, can I do that, okay? Psalm 91, verse 1 says, Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely He will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with His feathers and under His wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your right side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. If you say, the Lord is my refuge, and you make the most high your dwelling place, no harm will overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Did you know the Bible says, the Hebrew says that God has sent angels on assignment over every child of God to protect you. He will send his angels to guard you. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. That is God's protection. And some of you need to grab that verse and like make that a daily reading. If you're in this place of anxiety, of obsessing with safety, this is God's protection. According to scriptures, God encircles, encompasses, covers, and shields those who make him their refuge. His presence, the anointing of God, is a kind of force field protection surrounding the child of God, making you inaccessible to the enemy, no matter the circumstances around you. This is how men and women of God throughout the ages were able to be kept safe through dangerous dangerous situations. It's how Daniel was able to survive the lion's den. It was the presence of God, the anointing and glory of God, encompassing, encircling him. God was the refuge for Daniel in the middle of the lion's den. It shut the lion's mouth. It's why Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were able to step. They, they, they didn't bow, and they didn't get burned by that fiery furnace because there was a force-filled protection of the glory of God around them. Not only that, there was a third man in the fire. The presence of God was with them in the fire. The same protection belongs to us today if we replace our fears with trust in God's promises. If we dwell in the shelter of the Most High, And declare what this psalmist says, he is my refuge, my fortress, my God, in whom I will trust. 
He is my refuge, my fortress, my God in whom I trust. He is my refuge. I'm running to him. My fortress, my God whom I trust. I don't care how many times you got to declare that or quote that before you start believing it and acting on it or until your fears dissipate. He's my refuge and my fortress, my God whom I trust. I'm telling you, you can operate by a different spirit. You can be anxious for nothing. Child of God, you can be anxious for nothing. If you, if, if you don't obsess over safety, and number three, you become obsessed with something else. You become obsessed with obedience. Forty years later, after wandering in the desert, only Joshua and Caleb are the ones who survived that wandering experience of those who went into the land because they couldn't see the land through the right lens, the right perspective. God now commands Joshua and Caleb, 40 years later, to move forward. Let me show it to you. Joshua chapter 1, verse 7. God says to them, be strong and very courageous. So look what he says. Be careful. Not like your mama said it, though. Not like some of you were saying it. Be careful. Be careful. The world's dangerous place. No, he says, be careful to obey. Look, are you putting the fear of man in your children, or are you putting the fear of God in them? Come on, you should be. You should be saying, hey, guys, hey, kids, be careful. But you shouldn't be saying, be careful out there. You should be saying, be careful to obey the, the Lord your God. Be careful to obey the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. And then he tells us how to replace our obsessions here. Whether your obsession is for safety or maybe that's not your obsession today. Maybe that's not the obsessions you're dealing with. God tells Joshua how to replace any obsession with obedience in this next verse. Look at verse 8. Keep this book. Oh, this is it. Keep, keep this book of the law always on your lips meditate on it day and night. Hey, here's the solution. Instead of spreading the wrong report, you got to get the word of God on your lips. Make sure you're saying the right things, man. Make sure the right words are coming. The, the word of God should be on your lips. Meditate on his word. You know that word meditate is ruminate. It's the same word. You're, instead of ruminating on what if it's going to happen, obsessing over your safety, you meditate on the promises of God and the word of God. Look what it says. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it, then you'll be prosperous and successful. So I read it, I study it, I fill my mind with it. Now look at the result. Joshua, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Some of you have listened to the enemy and you don't think you're strong or courageous. You think you're timid, you think you're weak, you think that's not you, it's not your personality. That is a lie of the enemy. Listen, that's a different spirit. That is the wrong spirit you're listening to. There is a different spirit. God is commanding you to operate by a new spirit. Be strong and courageous, he says. Do not be afraid. A command of God that cannot even be accomplished if you don't follow verse 8. If you don't get your words and your lips declaring the word of God. If you don't start meditating and ruminating on the right things. You cannot obey the command to be strong and courageous and to be fearful of nothing. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. You're not going alone. You're not doing this alone. I'm there. I'm with you. My presence is going with you. So, so we got to replace this obsession with safety and our anxiety with obsessing with obedience. And number four, take small steps daily to confront and overcome your fears. I, I, I want to encourage some of you today to, to start believing again that you can be free, that you can actually think differently, that you can actually be anxious for nothing. Like, form a plan today. Form a plan to start taking some steps towards confronting and overcoming the fears that are holding you back from God's word. Now, for anyone who's dealing with debilitating anxiety, I want you to know, I'm not anti-medication. I'm not. I, but medicating your anxiety should only be considered as a stepping stone to accomplishing this, taking steps daily to confront and overcome your fears. I'm going to actually address this more detail next week. Okay, the only reason why I bring it up now, because I got a few emails from some of you that can't wait four weeks to give me the time to actually tackle this. So calm down. I'm not anti-anxiety, medication. You know, I'm leery of it. Heck yeah. I'm, I'm very, very leery of it. It should only be taken if there's with trusted physician, therapist, and some wise counsel. If you don't got all three of those with you, then you need to stop and get all three of those together. 
and, and only use it as a stepping stone to, to confront daily and overcome the fears. And depending on the severity of your fear, of your obsession, your safety, depending on what's threatening you and whatever you're feeling, it might take you one day, a period of weeks, months, maybe even longer to walk through that. And look, God knows. God doesn't want you. He's not going to, you know, this is, why, this, is how he did, this is how he dealt with the Israelites. He knew they were afraid. He knew they were terrified. He didn't say, all right, be strong and courageous. Go tackle that 10-foot giant right there. Take him down right now. No, he didn't do that. All he, all he, look what he did. He just asked him to take a step. That's it. Look at Joshua chapter 3, verse 15. The Jordan is at its flood stage during the harvest. So the Jordan River was at its height. Yet as soon as the priests who would carry the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream, stopped flowing. So the people crossed over opposite Jericho. So here's, here's what God told them to do. All God told them to do, he didn't tell them, okay, go, go, go fight those giants now that you're so afraid of. That's not what he said. All he said is, take a step. Step into this. Hey, just take a step into the river. Come, come on over here and watch me. Watch me work. As you step, watch me work. And as they stepped out and they stepped into that Jordan, it dried up. The, it dried up again right before them. And God didn't tell him to stop there. He said, he said, okay, come on. Come on, cross over this thing. Continue stepping. Come on over to this. Come on over to the land of Canaan. Get out of there, out of the wilderness. And, come. and all they did is have to step. That's all they did was step. They didn't have to fight the giant yet. They just stepped. And then they all crossed over in, in opposite of Jericho. And y'all know that battle, Jericho. He didn't even tell them, now go tackle that. City. He didn't tell them to do that, did he? You know what he did? He had them continue stepping. All right, now take, take a walk around this thing. Just keep walking, just keep stepping, just keep stepping, just little steps, you guys. Seven times even. In fact, I don't even want you guys to say a word because you guys are stupid and you guys say the wrong stuff. So shut your mouth. You're going to ruin it. Shut your mouth. Y'all don't know how to talk yet. Just keep stepping. Just keep stepping towards my will. Just keep doing it once, twice. Be quiet. Every, I, I think every time they walk around, their confidence is building. The worship team was leading them. The confidence is building. And you all know the story. At the seventh time around, they, they lifted up a shout of triumph, victory, and praise that the walls came crumbling down. And, and then they, they saw God go before them, and they had the confidence to step into battle now. But it just started with a small step. That's it. Now, God's not calling you to fight your giant and defeat your giant today, possibly. I just want you to believe again to step. Take a step towards God's will for your life. Take a step out of fear, out of your obsession. Take a step out of what you're focusing on and put your gaze upon God and step into his purpose and his promise for your life. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.